Uh, my name is Tim Morehouse, and I'm a director of community partnerships with Alberta Children and Youth Services. And I'd really like to welcome uh, you here this morning for folks who are in the room and folks who are connected by the various video conferencing sites. Uh, for today's session with Dr. Drew Bremnus and Wanda Paulsen. Uh, the session is on re reactive attachment disorder and FASD. Before I introduce uh, Drew and Wanda further, a few of the housekeeping uh, items we'd like to go over. All of the sites have been muted at the bridge, but if you could just make sure that your microphones are turned off as well. If you do experience any technical issues during the course of the presentation and discussion this morning, please let your local site contact know and they'll follow up accordingly. And if you have questions uh, during the presentation, you can email them to erin, E-R-I-N dot day at gov dot ab dot ca and we'll see if we can get those into the conversations here as well. If you have questions for the presenters after the session, um, the contact information is included in the back of the handouts that have been provided. And evaluations are really important to us in terms of how we're doing with this initiative. So the evaluation will be emailed out to session participants. If you haven't already, please sign in the, sign the login sheets. That's what uh, enables us to send out the evaluations afterwards. We have 40 sites attending the session today, so we're really pleased with the interest and the participation. And we have about 20-ish folks here in the room, so uh, thank you. That's wonderful to see as well. This is a part of our initiative around the 10-year strategic plan on FASD, and education and training is a critical component of that. So we're very pleased in the continued interest and the participation in video conferencing as a way of working at that uh, goal in terms of education and training. So, um, Andrew Bremnis has been a child psychiatrist for 31 years, having previously been on faculty at State University in New York in Stony Brook and the University of California and currently, he is a clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of Alberta. He's always been interested in biopsychosocial spiritual approaches to medical and psychiatric problems. And in 1998, he received a certificate in medical acupuncture from the University of Alberta and went on to postgraduate studies in Beijing, China. His current research is aimed at trauma and attachment and providing clinicians with not only more tools in the toolbox, but in being more comfortable with complementary paradigms to work between so that each patient might receive the most specific and most effective treatment in their healing process. Uh, Wanda Paulson um, has been working with children and families in men with mental health related issues for approximately 20 years. She holds a master's degree in psychology and a doctorate in education counseling psychology. Ms. Polzin is a social worker who presently works as a mental health clinician and program manager of school-age services at Child Adolescent Family Mental Health, CASA. Her specific interests are in the areas of trauma and attachment as well as fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. So if you could join me in welcoming Dr. Drew and Wanda. So I will speak first and then Wanda will um, follow me. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here this morning and to see such uh, bright, shiny faces here in the room, as well as those across TV land out in, across the province. Um, those of us who work in the area of attachment and trauma are certainly <clears throat> appreciative to get invited to an FASD learning series because it's common sense that if the only cause of fetal alcohol syndrome is that a mom drank in pregnancy, then what other problems are centered around that issue as well? And they tend to flourish in the first couple of years of life, and hence the tie-in to attachment disorders and trauma. 
So let's have a look at some of the underpinnings of attachment and why we are concerned. Attachment is slightly different than bonding. I like to think uh, a lot of parents will say, oh, I have such a good bond with my child. But I like to envision bonding as uh, like an elastic band and you feel somewhat connected to your child. And as the child grows and develops, that elastic band expands until <clears throat> when they can crawl, they go in the next room, and when they got their feet, they maybe go in the backyard to the point where they're going to school and later on in their teenage lives out in the big old world. Um, attachment, however, is envision envisioning that elastic band as if it's a uh, computer cord, a digital cord, uh, across which a billion bits of information go, both to and from the child and the mom. And if we can envision an attachment like that, you can just get some appreciation of how much information, no kidding, a billion bits, is flowing back and forth all the time. And one of our slides is going to summarize that the organization of the child's mind comes from the organization of the parent's mind. And again, getting back to fetal alcohol, we can understand why, therefore, at times, the mom's mind is not going to be well organized in order to organize the child's mind. So, <clears throat> it has to do with the dyad, and I always envision attachment as sort of babe in arms, and what is occurring when a mom has a child in arms. And there's three components to attachment, an enduring emotional relationship with a specific person, relationship characterized by safety, comfort, soothing, and pleasure, and then loss, or even threat of loss of this person, brings distress. You know when we see these wonderful um, northern uh, landscapes with caribou herds going across the, the Great Plains, and these moms drop their babies in the deep snow in the middle of winter or something, and that baby caribou has got to, in the middle of 10,000 caribou herd, decide on the specificity and proximity to its mother. So it's got to memorize its mother and it's got to stay very close. So proximity and specificity are what, are what create attachment. And it's no different with our human children. They have, to be, they have to specify the mother and then remain very close in proximity to that mother. So the ABCs of attachment. Tunement is <clears throat> this flow of information between mother and child. And it has to do with, um, in the first 18 months of life, a lot of sensory motor uh, input. And those of you who took Piaget in your university courses will remember that in cognitive development, the first 18 months of life has to do with sensory motor thinking or sensory motor learning, where you're not yet thinking thoughts until really language develops at 18 months to 36 months. And therefore, uh, if you have difficulties in that first 18 months of life, it gets laid down as body sensations, what we call sensory perceptual information, rather than what we think of as memory based on thought and language. Second one is balance, a healthy physiological state. So whether the child or the mother is out of a healthy physiological state or balance, homeostasis, will throw the dyadic attunement out of line. So think mother and child. And in our program, our client or patient is actually the dyad. It's not the mother or the child, it's the dyad. And it's a wonderful piece of both science and um, <clears throat> psychology that you can treat the that wonderful attunement between two people, I guess it's a little bit like couples therapy, right? That it's neither the husband nor the wife, it's the couple and the relationship between the two that is the client or patient. And then coherence, which is an internal world capable of adapting to constant environmental changes and caregiver or givers are responsible for setting this foundation. So what's important for healthy attachment? The primary relationship because this sets the template for all future relationships. We sometimes say that the primary or primordial relationship we all have in life takes place with our mothers or our principal caregivers from about 18 months to 36 months. And every other relationship we have is based on that. But there's a lot that leads up to that. 
And a lot of what we'll talk about this morning is the 18 months that led up to that, 0 to 18. The quantity and quality of interactions is vital, directly related to neurochemical activities in the brain, and helps to organize brain systems. So it's hard to imagine that when a mom has a babe in arms, and they eye gaze at each other, and they facial gaze each other. Did you know that in the newborn nursery, on the first or second day in the newborn nursery, the child can tell a two-dimensional view of its mom's face from other women's faces? Because it imprints on it immediately, just like that caribou has the term between 10,000 caribou in this herd, which is my mom? And they have to do it right away, and they're moving with the herd. And they've got to stay really close to that person. The timing is in the first three years of life, and the critical period, the first year of life is essential because the child is completely helpless and entirely depends on the mom or caregiver, and hence, um, if there's something wrong with mom, this is where the problems begin. So normal attachment is an organized, cascading, neurodevelopmental pattern that establishes the foundation of the future experiences of self, such as bodily states, emotions, and self-regulation. I mean, just think of the, of the kids that you guys take care of. Those are three big things right there. They're bodily states. A lot of physical health states depend on normal attachment. They've done some wonderful studies now of the big bad illnesses in adulthood, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and to seeing what the rates are when early uh, trauma has taken place, say in the first three to five years of life, and the rates are much, much higher when the dyadic attunement is broken up by uh, early childhood trauma. So it sets the definition of physical health as well as mental, psychological, and spiritual health. So experiences of self, bodily states, emotions, and self-regulation, we're always asking our kids, these special group of kids, to self-regulate Come on, behave yourselves. And then a relationship to others in the sense of caregiving, which then goes on to teachers and coaches and, you know, the whole village in life, as well as seeking comfort and safety. And you know that if our kids don't seek comfort and safety, they don't last long. Or if they do last long, they get into a whole heap of trouble. This requires appropriate parenting, which is consistent nurturance, plus predictable safety and structure. This is the yin-yang of parenting that we've all struggled with if we've ever had a child. The best nurturance, the best frustration. Because we're, we're always asking our kids, healthy or not, to live in a box, right? And this box is their boundaries. And a lot of FASD children, and particularly if they're blessed with RAD or trauma, don't figure out their boundaries like other kids do. And we take that for granted out of normal, healthy, dyadic attunement the kids will know their boundaries, and of course our kids haven't had that, so they don't know their boundaries. And a whole heap of trouble ensues. Attachment is absolutely experience dependent, so that's why in the first year or two of life, we stimulate the heck out of our kids. We dangle all that stuff in their cribs, and we bounce them around, and if you're dad, you throw them way up in the sky, and you catch them, hopefully. And all kinds of sensory input. Now, mom's sensory input is very gentle. It tends to be the touching, soothing, stroking, humming, rocking, lullabying kind of stuff. And dad stimulation, yin-yang, is a lot of heavy movement, large muscle, horseplay, and it takes both for the body to register uh, appropriate attunement. And the first, of course, in the first 18 months of life, it's mostly just mom. And after that, you know, dads get to play as well. A huge number of genes encode the timing and details of the circuits. So again, it's hard to imagine that as a mom is holding this baby and going through the normal, just enjoyable experience of nursing, stroking, humming, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that that attunement is laying down brain tracks, physical brain tracks that pervade the brain. And when we're blessed with trauma and attachment issues, not only are those tracks that are supposed to get laid down not laid down, tracks that aren't supposed to get laid down are laid down. So therefore, from then on, the hardware is off, and it was the software, which is experience going into the hardware, that completely altered the hardware. Now, for FASD, of course, the hardware is already altered. 
in ways that we don't fully understand because of FASD. So now these kids will have a, a double, triple whammy if they've got FASD, attachment disorders, and trauma disorders. And you rarely ever get trauma disorders without an attachment disorder. Once in a while, there's a really good mom who happens to allow her kids to get traumatized, but that's not so common. Mostly they are blessed with both. Experiences that we give these kids, all of our kids, activate specific neuronal connections and creates new synapses. This is mostly right hemisphere activity. Facial expression, perception of emotion, relational communication, all the non-rational stuff that comes out of our left hemisphere. And one of the reasons that we're interested at CASA in complementary alternative methods, I mean, they're complementary alternative to orthodox medicine, but not complementary alternative to most of us in our daily lives. We take this stuff for granted. Yoga and meditation and, and, and drama and expressive arts and some of the things we'll talk about today. A lot of sensory input. But it's all right hemisphere. And you should know that because you'll have other kids in your practices that have right hemispheric problems like nonverbal learning disorders. And Lord knows what fetal alcohol spectrum disorder messes up in the right hemisphere. But this is what it does, facial expression, perception of emotional, uh, emotion, relational communication. Brain, differi brain differentiation requires genetic information and proper experiences, allowing normal self-regulation, relatedness, language, and memory, in short, an organized mind. Here we note the importance of the orbital frontal cortex, this stuff up over your eyes here, which is the seat of our executive functioning, which tells us how to get through our day-to-day -day lives. So, of course, that is a bit messed up in fetal alcohol syndrome, so they can't get through their ordinary day-to-day -day lives. But this even messes it up further because there's some pretty good recent research that if the limbic system isn't modulating feelings correctly, it's the limbic system, which is deeper in your brain, your emotional brain, that stimulates the prefrontal cortex to do its thing. Now, that, that means that even in therapy, if you haven't allowed a child to acknowledge a feeling they have, like this is what I'm feeling, and then self-regulate that feeling, they can't get to the problem solving of that thing that caused the feeling in the first place because they can't even get to their prefrontal cortex. It doesn't get any further than their emotional brain. So we have to build back these circuits, and this is where we hope the healing of these kids comes in. States of attunement. Now here's a normal cycle of dyadic attunement. And this is kind of important for the kids we see in all of our practices, whether we're teaching, social working, doctoring, whatever we're doing. States of attunement are interrupted by periods of disruption followed by repair of mutually coordinated attunement. So let's take an example of a normal healthy mom and a normal healthy baby okay, in the first year of life. So let's say they're gazing at each other they're having a wonderful time. Um, they're laughing and giggling to each other. And the baby gets so gleeful it starts clapping. And the mom, say the baby's resting in her lap, she starts clapping and maybe they're singing some lullaby or something. And the baby gets overexcited and reaches up and tugs really hard on the mom's hair in the child's overexcitement. Then what happens is the mom pulls her head back, grimaces in pain, and lets her touch of the baby go for a moment because she's just startled by the pain in her head. The baby then suddenly changes from a laugh to a very distressed look, freezes, and then cries as if there's no tomorrow. And all that takes place innocently. All that takes place in about five to 10 seconds. And then the mom collects herself and then reattunes to her child, picks the child back up into her arms, starts stroking the cheek, re-singing her lullaby, smiling, bringing back her soothing voice, and within hopefully a few seconds, the child calms down, quits crying, and knows that it's safe again. So there we just had a normal cycle of attunement, interrupted by a period of disruption, and then followed by a repair back to attunement. And this is, each cycle brings greater complexity in regulating affective states, leads to greater confidence in learning and exploration. And for the preschooler, it's all about exploration, getting out there and exploring your universe. And then experiencing genuine feelings without fear of danger ensuing. Because if that child felt distraught at that moment 
and the mom couldn't recover from her own upset and was tossed aside on the couch because the mother then had to pace back and forth because maybe she'd been abused before in her life and this triggered her to some abuse she'd had because someone tugged on her hair. Meanwhile, the child's not coming back to any repair. It's left in a state of disruption. Now, when you see your kids, now they're 8, 9, 10, 12 years old, and you see your kids, whether you're teaching them or social working them or treating them, when they're now with their good, healthy, normal foster moms, adoptive moms, etc., they will also go through these periods of attunement, disruption, repair, and back to attunement. And you have to remind them that's part of the normal cycle because the parent will say, oh, God, I've been at this for three years. I've been living in my home for three years. When is this going to end? But a normal mom will say, no, that's just part of the deal. There's attunement, disruption, repair, and back to attunement. So if genuine feeling states are thus tolerated in dyadic attunement, at least towards a genuine child, rather than the defenses against genuine feelings, such as all the symptoms we see, denial, withdrawal, lying, stealing, conning, manipulating, aggression, all the symptoms we see, and there are serious attachment disorders. And here, fear, just like the child who may have got tossed in the couch, disorganizes the mind, whereas secure dyadic attachment and repair of disruption reorganizes the mind. And this is an evolutionary solution to danger back when we used to live in the jungle, where there may have been danger situations all the time, where the child learns to regulate fear. And what happens to most of the kids we treat? They can't regulate fear. So they're way out of sorts with fear, or they're developing all kinds of defense mechanisms against fear, which is the symptoms that walk into our schools and our homes and our offices. If fear of danger comes from the dyad itself, as with caregivers' dysregulation, often triggered by the <coughs> child's genuine feeling states, then we may spiral into a destructive cycle of RAD and all its difficult expressions. So a summary of this is that in the first several years of life, the parent's mind acts to constantly alter the child's mind, developing neural circuits of increasingly sophisticated self-regulation. So I'm just going to breeze through attachment disorders. It's a broad arena of dysregulation of mood, behavior, and social relationships. The period of pathological attachment is generally thought to be six months to three years. There's a bit of um, debate about that. Some people feel that um, even the first six months of life, you can, if it goes so, so wrong, you can have a child come out with RAD. But most of the literature will suggest that before six months of life, a child's living a fairly oceanic uh, existence where it and mom are one versus, gee, there's me and there's mom. And so they generally say from three months to six, uh, three years, uh, best to consider along a spectrum from a healthy, secure attachment to mid-range, insecure, avoidant attachment or other undesirable forms through to non-attachment or disorganized attachment, such as in RAD. Disorganized attachment is the most severe, where the biopsychosocial systems become disorganized in the same fashion as disorganized schizophrenia, where many domains of function are simultaneously uh, disturbed. Disoriented could be also be used because literally they don't know that they're here and now. They think they're then and there. And you will have all seen children that you may not have realized are living then and there, and they're not living here and now. So that's what I mean by disoriented, the time, person, and place. The chief cause of this disorganization is ongoing neglect and trauma, i.e. disorganized parenting, and hence developmental post-traumatic stress disorder is usually present. So for DSM, and this is going to hopefully change in DSM-5 and get a bit more specific, I mean, there's only one attachment disorder in DSM, the most severe form of the spectrum. So it calls for a markedly disturbed social relatedness, uh, pathogenic care, and then the way we try and discern this is through checklists and in infants. So this is what the therapist and or docs will look for, severe colic, failure to thrive. Anaclytic depression is an interesting thing. Anaclytic is from the Latin term to lean on. And when kids have no one to lean on, we can call it anaclytic depression. And it's the same as extreme failure to thrive, where these kids don't survive, even though they're mechanically fed. 
failure to attach or bond, resistant to comfort holding. These are the kids that even as an infant will arch their back and not let you hold them. The so that's an infant. The presentation in children are boundaries such as personal space, strangers, either frozen watchfulness or indiscriminate sociability, boundaries in rage, boundaries in sleep, bizarre lying and stealing, hoarding food. Food's a big boundary issue with our rad kids. Sexual touch issues, manipulative, emotionally phony, as if. And a lot of these are the basis of access to diagnosis further into adulthood, the borderline histrionic uh, sociopathic form of access to pathology. So if you're wondering where that stuff comes from, this is where it comes from. Uh, I won't go into this. This is an, in, uh, an interview you can do, and it covers the 12 items or boundaries, so we'll skip through that. Um, but the self-concepts are important because you'll all meet these self-concepts, but you'll meet them in poor behavior. But here's what's underlying some of that poor behavior. The self-concept, I must be bad, and my behavior is who I am. My bad behavior is who I am. And we need to change that to I am good, loved, and lovable. But these, these self-concepts, unfortunately, these affirmations are written in stone. Trust no one, and survival depends on being in control. So that's where lying, conning, manipulating, you know, aggression, et cetera, come in. Intimidation. And we have to heal that to where it becomes, I trust the world and me in it. I'm not, sorry, I do nothing right. I am competent. I deserve to be hated. I deserve a chance. Others deserve my hate. I can forgive and attach to others. Generally, RAD is a parent and children before the age of five. It has, again, lack of consistent care and nurturing in early years, characterized by the inability to establish age-appropriate social contact. And there's the two types, disinhibited and inhibited. Now, because it always, almost always, is present with the post-traumatic stress disorder spectrum, um, and this is different than the typical ordinary, I mean, there isn't a person who is in this room or who I'm speaking with out there in TV land who hasn't had some form of trauma in their lives. I don't care if it's a fender bender all the way through to something quite significant. Even loss of a loved one is a trauma. But here we're talking about kids who didn't have a single trauma that often is from a stranger. This is trauma that happened time and again over various developmental periods from someone who was supposed to love us or at least from someone who was supposed to protect us from the one who's doing this to us. The overlap of symptoms between RAD and post-traumatic stress includes um, am amnesia and dissociative episodes, alterations in relationship to self, distorted relationships, bodily and affective dysregulation. But also, these things are overlapping with FASD, hence our talk this morning, but also depression and bipolar illness, and ADHD, ODD, and CD. So it's really hard to tell sometimes what these kids have. We have to watch them for some time in different settings before we really know. But all of them share aspects of cognitive, mood, and behavioral dysregulation. That's all kinds of diagnostic problems. The definition of FASD, I'm going to whistle through this because you guys have been through it with other experts who have been with you in this series. So you know all of this. Uh, you know all of this. Uh, you know all of this. Um, you know how complex the patterns of behavior and cognitive abnormalities are. Uh, they're always inconsistent with nor normal developmental levels. Um, there's a family history of, of um, alcoholism, trauma, and tra sometimes transgenerational abuse. So other obvious diagnostic questions always arise, and these are the areas in which they arise. Poor social perception, um, poor verbal memory, all the things to do with executive functioning, because they don't have access to their executive functioning most of the time. The diagnosis of FASD involves case management, uh, the correct docs, the correct clinicians, occupational therapy, speech and language. It's coded on the four uh, point Likert scale on growth deficiency, facial anomalies, central nervous system damage or dysfunction, and gestational exposure to alcohol 
hopefully with first-hand information. Um, so FASD is a spectrum disorder, whereas RAD is something that's fairly set in stone. It's already one end of a spectrum, as I said before. Um, dual diagnosis, most of the kids I see in, at CASA in the trauma attachment program would have S FASD plus RAD plus post-traumatic stress disorder plus attention deficit disorder plus some kind of learning diagnosis. Now that's five and plus whatever else they happen to have. Some of them are quite anxious, some of them have OCD, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you end up with a, quite a long diagnostic list. And it presumes certain things. And these are the things that you guys will see in your day-to-day -day lives with these kids. And it requires a biopsychosocial language, educational OT, an entire village of ongoing support. The risk factors that FASD have in common with RAD include higher maternal age, lower socioeconomic status and education levels, prenatal exposure to other subs including nicotine, and custody changes. Uh, also the risk factors include paternal drinking and drugging, and we often hear the story that, you know, a woman picks the wrong guy and gets into something that she hasn't even been into before and then becomes pregnant. Poor access to prenatal services and poor nutrition and chaotic environment are kind of the norm. And the common features are both require ultra-dedicated caregivers, which is where your guys' support comes in so importantly. 24-7 supervision, continuous external brain, ongoing advocacy, um, caregivers who can take care of themselves and who can reflect on their own experience while they're caregiving these kids, who understand vicarious trauma because Lord knows if you've had any trauma, these kids will find it and push those buttons. Vital that neither diagnosis, FASD or RAD, allows for ever giving up, why bother, or the pessimism of, well, there's nothing we can do for these kids anyway. Because in just a few seconds, Wanda's going to tell up, come up and tell us what in fact we do. Okay, so I'm going to skip through to where you see a nice picture of a family, where it says similar effects of fetal alcohol syndrome and RAD, and I'm going to call up one of my esteemed colleagues, <laughs> Wanda Polson. Thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the effects of FASD and RAD um, and how and what we recommend as part of treatment and what that looks like um, on more of a practical uh, basis in schools, um, within families, and within treatment itself. So the behavioral effects um, with FASD and with RAD are very, very similar. As Dr. Bremnis um, discussed, we have a very difficult time teasing out some of the disorders. So oftentimes there's not just one presentation. Um, children look different um, with regard to different levels of anxiety, different levels of depression, different levels of attachment, and that can present very differently. But the behavioral effects that we generally see and that we're dealing with with regard to um, what parents are, are presenting to us in terms of what they're struggling with, what teachers are bringing forth as issues in the classroom is that they become easily frustrated. Um, that there's, there's no ability to respond to um, sort of the stop, think, react approach that typically gets used in classrooms. That they're distractible and, and we often see um, ADHD, ADD types of behaviors. Um, the children can be rigid, um, perseverative, and oversensitive to stimuli or undersensitive to stimuli. At CASA, one of the um, specific areas of treatment in terms of the work that we do in our trauma and attachment program is that we deal specifically with some of these sensory issues. Some of the children that we work with um, definitely have either are oversensitive or undersensitive to stimuli. So what that looks like 
is that we can have issues with regard to children who can't go to sleep and um, the parents don't have any idea why. They try a vari variety of techniques and it can be as simple. We've, we've had um, a case where a child says that, well, I hear the refrigerator in the room in the kitchen that's down the hall and that's really bothersome. And so that stimuli is, is just incredibly disruptive to them and their ability to concentrate or to regulate themselves. Some of the other behavioral issues is um, behavioral inconsistencies. And when we work with parents or caregivers or teachers with regard to this, we have them sort of recognize their child as on a thermometer and give them a, a visual thermometer uh, in terms of recognizing sort of ages where they're at and what that looks like. And even if we're dealing with a 16-year-old with RAD and FASD, we know that chronologically they're 16 years of age, but oftentimes on that barometer they're acting as if they're two years old. And so when we're responding in classrooms or as parents and we're trying to respond to them as 16 years old, it's impossible. It's, it's, it's a, it's a dis, disconnect. There's, there's no way to meet them on their level. And so oftentimes we repetitively ask them, where are they at right now? And quite clearly the teachers or parents can identify, well, they're acting as if they're two years old. And we ask them at that point, then that's the place that you need to meet them, is to deal with these behavioral inconsistencies. While they're off, you know, um, trying to use drugs and trying to individuate on some level, the same token, their, their behaviors are not consistent with that. Um, with regard to neurological and cognitive effects, again, we see a lot of frontal lobe issues. And again, when we work with caregivers or teachers, our, our discussion with them is that these children um, who have a diagnosis of RAD and FASD need to have external brains. So we need to be those external brains for them so that they can sort of have a, a corrective experience and be able to learn from us and at times, depending on the level of brain damage, they're incapable at times of making decisions and choices. And caregivers, teachers having that expectation is just going to lead to more problems and, and is really setting up these kids for failure and for depression and anxiety and, and things that they aren't able to cope with. Um, we often see difficulty with short-term memory. Sometimes this has to be teased out because, as Dr. Bremnis mentioned, we, we see these sort of mini seizures or mini um, sort of frozen states where it's, it's hard to determine whether or not they're actually able or capable to have this memory pro processing or whether they're just sort of stuck in that state. Often we see seizure disorders and um, with this, in terms of dealing with it and having some strategies, we talk about repetition, constant repetition. <coughs> instructions have to be clear, short, and repetitive. Um, again, difficulty with information processing, um, and it's very clear that it's difficult for these children or teens to predict outcomes. Again, that refers back to the external brain. What's interesting is that there's a lot of research out there with children with FASD and RAD um, disorders. And what's, what's interesting is that if, if we had a spectrum of um, a visual tape that's caught um, from someone being, you know, just sort of a, a normal sort of face, a, a state just as you are sitting here today, um, to becoming angry, a normal, normal child would say, you know, if there was a clip, you know, this long, they would say, okay, um, I can see that someone's becoming angry about here. With children with FASD um, or RAD, what's interesting is that they can predict that anger change or that change with their caregiver much, much sooner. It's in, instead of here, it's here. And what that tells us is that we need to work with their caregivers. This dyad that Dr. Bremnis, Bremnis was talking about is, is vital because while the caregivers themselves may not even understand that they're angry or frustrated or anxious, 
the children are picking up on this and responding back to them. So it's, it's like a biofeedback loop that's taking place. Um, some more neurological and cognitive effects, again, speech and language problems, um, difficulty retaining information and retrieval difficulties. I'm going to skip through some of this. Um, emotional effects, um, again, with children and teens with FASD, um, their developmental age and chronological age are often changing. So what that can look like, using the example of the 16-year-old, is that it's very difficult for caregivers, unless they're constantly asking themselves the question of where are, where are they at right now? What age are they at right now? Because this shifts, and it can shift. We see it shift um, in our groups. It shifts constantly within minutes. They can be acting like or as if a two- or three-year-old in, in some circumstances, and then like a 30-year-old in other situations. And it's just really important to continue to ask yourself so that you can respond to, to that and become attuned to what their needs are. Um, similarly, for both diagnoses, um, individuals with RAD, FASD, um, typically have impulsive uh, behaviors. Um, they're emotionally rigid at times and can be depressed and isolated. And this can come and go. The emotional effects, um, both again, can present with a very flat effect. As teenagers, we often see that they can become really irritable. Um, children, more tenter ta temper tantrums to rage. And there's a tendency to react rather than respond. Some of the social effects, um, again, delays in normal social development. And separation anxiety may occur sometime between six and eight rather than six months and 18 months. So this is, again, that barometer is that these things can replay themselves at different times that don't necessarily seem to make sense unless we are therapeutically using ourselves to determine where they're at. They can present as socially immature, but on the other spectrum, they can present initially as very socially mature. It's not until later that we see some of the, the effects that come out that demonstrate the immaturity. Easily suggestible and influenced, and they require constant supervision. Some more social effects um, have difficulty internalizing modeled behavior. Oftentimes, they lack stranger anxiety. Um, so they would just kind of go off with anybody. Um, on the other end of that, they can present quite opposite in that they're afraid of everything, fearful of everything and everyone. Um, can be argumentative due the, to the lack of understanding. And they have difficult reading people congruently. So what they might see sometimes as someone being sad, um, they might read as, as being somewhat different. Um, sadness could be anger in some situations. Manage time poorly. Um, we, we constantly see this with the teens that we're working with. And so when caregivers are, are setting expectations or trying to parent them, some of these issues need to be sort of toned down in a way that's really concrete so that the children, the teens can be responsive and there's not so much consequence as teaching. Social effects, um, communication difficulties. Um, it's very difficult for these children and teens to identi identify their feelings, especially we see sometimes verbally, which is why our treatment is really multimodal, sort of looking at the kinesthetic, visual, auditory, um, pulling those all together to um, try to allow for, for different expression. And again, overall arrest in social development and social skills. So what do we do? What do we try to encourage caregivers to do is from seeing their child as defiant or bad to just defended and challenged, from seeing them from oppositional to, to that they just can't or they don't have the skills, um, from seeing them from being lazy to, well, they're actually trying hard, but there's some limitations. Um, 
we try to give a new perspective on things and with some education with parents which is really as as Dr. Brown has talked about that dyad is so important the information that we give to caregivers to teachers to people in the community that's all part of the village we talk about the village needing to deal with these with, with these children to create success um, again some overall common strengths is that children teens with FASD and RAD can be really curious they have a lot of questions they may not always ask those questions but they are curious they can be affectionate so the thought that they just won't be affectionate or can't be affectionate is not necessarily true it's just they need a corrective experience about what that means and how to demonstrate appropriate affection they can be gentle and compassionate loving tactile cuddly What's interesting is there's some research that's out with regard to animal assisted therapy and um, trauma and attachment and FASD and there's a lot of work that's um, happening actually in Israel right now with these children um, and their caregivers with regard to utilizing animal assisted therapy as an initial step to then be able to translate some of the attachment or the bonding from the animal to their primary caregiver and it's really positive results right now. Some strategies. Um, there's, there's sometimes a question about should we be dealing with um, treatment with regard to individual therapy or group therapy. I guess our approach is to look at at that in, as an individual basis. There's a lot of um, support for doing some individual dyadic work, um, but there's also some corrective experiences that can happen within the group. So again, our recommendation is to really meet the dyad where they're at and begin that process and, and as time goes on is just to reflect upon that. There's some pros and cons and along the way of treatment it's important to just be cognizant of, of what the needs are of that di the dyad. So I, I wouldn't say that it's a, a complete no, there shouldn't be any um, group therapy. I know that that question comes up sometimes with regard to treating FASD. So treatment of RAD, um, we recommend that with the parents and caregivers as well as teachers is that there's love and limits. So in doing so we clearly support the idea of having predictable physical, emotional and psychological safety. That there's consistent routines and, and rules that are established within the classroom as well as at home. And that caregivers have mental health. Respite care for these families is an absolute must and oftentimes it takes us many many months to um, convince the caregivers that this is an important piece of of their work with their child because we hear often that these parents say well I can't have respite care because when I come back into the home um, it's just you know ten times worse we have to reestablish those routines and rules and and that's probably true in fact but what we encourage is that if you can set some predictable times that there's respite care over time that will lessen and what happens with the families is that they develop relationships and the children develop relationships secondary relationships to the primary caregiver that can become positive and it gives the caregivers a break but it's also then not um, what we clearly see is that with respite care then there's not sort of the emergency need to pull these these kids away from their caregivers because something has, has sort of exploded emotionally in the family there's predictable times it doesn't seem so much as a um, as a disciplinary piece to go to respite care um, we talk a lot about um, vicarious trauma. The children demonstrate their stories either verbally or act them out on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, the caregivers dealing with these, sometimes in the moment, don't 
recognize what's going on, but they're vicariously traumatized. So to deal with that, uh, we think it's really important for the ongoing psychoeducation, the ongoing support, respite care, um, as well as some work with regard to groups and recognizing that there's other families out there that are dealing with some similar issues, which can be really nice because when parents finally connect, you know, they sort of give us the sigh of relief of, oh, I'm not crazy. So, you know, that's really, really important. Um, we remind parents that there's a place um, for RAD and our, our words for that with regard to place is that we just remind them that healing and their interactions require playful, loving, accepting, curious and empath empathic um, <coughs> interactions. And we structure that, and I'll, I'll be talking about that in just a few minutes. So, um, talked a little bit about this. So, treatment of RAD, um, again, it's dyadic attunement. We focus on the caregiver's state of mind, and we establish a healing place and, and a safe place for both the caregiver as well as the child or teen that we're working with. Um, in doing so, there's a sharing of subjective experiences, and as we have found in our program, very clearly, one impacts the other. So the, the caregiver, the primary caregiver, we all have stories, we all have narratives about our lives and, and what's happened, good and bad or, or, or otherwise, um, but those stories impact the children that we work with whether it's our own children or foster children or adoptive children and their stories impact ours and so again it's this this real um, entwining of stories and narratives and that becomes part of the treatment that that we do I want to clarify I'm sure that that you know this by now but we do not in any way um, recommend any of the rebirthing or co co coercive techniques um, that previously had been used with regard to treatment of um, attachment and trauma. Some of the previous techniques, I, I don't think there's any around anymore, I'm hoping not, but there used to be some um, proponents that would suggest that the attachment be very forceful, that there be sort of a forceful connection or a reestablishment of womb-like qualities for a caregiver. Um, and, and that, in, in many instances, would become extremely, extremely um, powerful with regard to fearfulness. And obviously, um, when, when anyone's put into a, a situation of fear, they're going to, it's going to be a fight or flight response. We do not suggest that at all. Medication treatment, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, just that, uh, <clears throat> as I said on the slide here, that uh, medications, because a lot of your kids will be on meds, and you'll wonder why sometimes, uh, whether in schools or in homes. Uh, the SSRIs appear to modulate limbic system, which is that emotional center that has to be regulated before the, ex the executive functioning centers up here can get to turn on. Uh, so it, it relates to anxiety, depression, and fear. Atypical neuroleptics, which some of you read in the newspaper these days that we're having all kind of concerns about their side effects. But in the risk-benefit ratio, there's some use of these things because uh, they appear to modulate or smooth tra uh, state transitions from one state of being to another state of being in our terms, moving from unsafe place to safe place. So they're helpful with rage, destructiveness, and impulsivity. Uh, clonidine, which is an interesting medicine they use in adults for high blood pressure, uh, helps regulate the fight or flight tendencies of post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as decreases impulsiveness. So if a child has ADHD and uh, post-traumatic stress, clonidine can be quite helpful. And then we have a series of adjunctive meds for the comorbid conditions such as sleep, you know, various medicines for ADHD and the like. So um, that's just a thought about the meds because <clears throat> we, we, you know, we consider the medication issue as part of a recipe. 
So when you have a biopsychosocial educational OT speech language, you know, recipe, uh, the medicine is going to be like, you know, baking soda when you bake a cake. If you leave it out, well, you still get a cake, maybe not the same cake, but, you know, so think of these treatment plans as a recipe, and you try and put the right recipe together so the right cake comes out. So what we um, really think that is the best way to approach children with FASD and RAD and the treatment is to have the caregivers become a part of that and looking at it as an inside-out approach. So recognizing that the caregiver stories, the caregiver's interactions um, are extremely important and anything that they aren't dealing with can lead to vulnerabilities in the dyad. Um, yeah, I'm just aware of time, so I'm, I'm going to skip through some of this because I think we've covered it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about CASA's Trauma and Attachment Program. In the TAG program, which we call for short, um, there's three phases. There's a stabilization phase, um, and within the stabilization phase, we to be part of the program, there needs to be, the dyad needs to have been stabilized for approximately two years. So we, we aren't um, suggesting that if children are, you know, going from one foster home to group home and back, that that's a good time to start this process. It's really important for there to be stabilization. And whether that's um, even of status from, um, treatment to TGO to PGO previously, those kinds of things need to be addressed. Um, basic trust and attachment needs to be demonstrated. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. As part of, um, I'm just going to head here. So in our tag one, the treatment and how that looks as part of the, the initial stages of, of treatment is that there's a lot of psychoeducation for the caregivers, but also for the larger community. Again, we really advocate that the treatment of these children, that it takes a village to, to raise children. And more specifically with RAD and FASD, it's an incredibly important for that to, to be the case. Stabilization and we work towards the development of a safe or holding environment, that it's non-intrusive and that we're just basically setting a therapeutic stage, that the caregivers are becoming more comfortable, that yes, they're, they're in this for the long haul, um, that they're committed to the program, they're committed to their children, but also giving the child a basis of, of what we call a safe place versus an unsafe place. With that, we introduce some therapeutic themes and we encourage what we call kit work. So if anyone's familiar with um, child parent relational therapy, it's similar to that. We have the, the parents or caregivers create a kit with their child based on a variety of different modalities, visual, kinesthetic, auditory, and, and it's, it's time, this kit is basically um, a time that they would take out the kit each day for about half an hour. We recommend that it happen daily if possible. Sometimes that's not always possible, but it's a special time that's created that they just have one-on-one -on -one time. Um, and basically, the hope is in doing that, it's a corrective experience going back to the nurturing piece on, on a more sort of dealing with a, a different age, but it is doing the nurturing. The tag two piece is, again, ongoing psychoeducation but more, if I can say, intrusive <coughs> strategies in that there are very specific therapeutic approaches that we use to address the, the post-traumatic stress, to uh, deal with the trauma and attachment issues. Some of those things include body work, um, internal processing, sensory motor profiles or feedback, sensory motor integration work, expressive therapies, journal work, drawing, play therapy and sand tray work. <clears throat> so the ongoing um, for TAG 3, thank you, for TAG 3 um, is ongoing work. And TAG 3 is parent support ongoing. So any caregivers, grandparents, any relatives, um, 
We've had teachers at some points join just to get some psychoeducation. So it's a process. It's, it's an in, individual but also a group process that takes place. So strategies. I'm going to um, clarify. One of our main goals in the program is to develop what we call a realistic narrative. And in conjunction with the realistic narrative is to establish a safe place. Interestingly, when we work with the dyad, our focus tends to be on the child with FASD and RAD, but we find very clearly that many caregivers actually don't have their own safe place. And so in establishing the caregiver's safe place, um, the child can, can establish that as well. How do we do that? We do that through relaxation, um, visualization, we incorporate some of the strategies in, in the kit time, and again from a multimodal perspective, looking at kinesthetic, visual, auditory um, interactions. So some of the multimodal things that we're talking about, movement exercise, um, the involvement potentially of OT um, to do some sensory processing or sensory integration, things like brain gym for those of you who are familiar with it, visual approaches are using expressive therapies, um, drawing, paint, using clay, token economies um, to, to have the visual within the classroom or at home, psychodrama, art therapy, or role playing. Auditory, we use music a lot um, for calming and relaxation. Within our group, we actually um, incorporate drumming as well. And again, all of these pieces um, tie in to create um, a safe place. I'm going to speak just really quickly about the incredible years. Um, it's a parenting program for those of you who are not familiar with it. It's based on um, best practice in, in addressing parenting needs and parenting education for their for their children, their interactions with their children. But I'm not sure if you can see this, but what we focus on is really establishing the, the base and that the base in, in the parenting pyramid is really the foundation of the um, interactions and the dyad and, and really the attachment piece. So oftentimes when people, caregivers and teachers get frustrated, um, what we immediately do is implement what's at the top here, consequences, um, or we try to redirect, or we um, um, set, set up, you know, really specific um, behavioral charts to deal with some things. What we really focus on as part of this parenting pyramid is the, the bottom piece, which is the foundation. Right at the bottom piece, again, if you just take a look at it, is the empathy, the play, the attention and involvement, problem solving, listening, talking, all of those things at the basis of this pyramid set that foundation and that's really the kit work or the the time to recreate the attunement. Do you have anything else you want to say about that? Well just if you'll notice <coughs> if you'll notice along the bottom of the pyramid it'll say <coughs> the benefits of the child so if you want the benefit to be problem solving cooperation self-esteem and attachment these are the things you should be doing. If you want increased social skills thinking skills and motivation these are the things you should be doing. If you want increased responsibility, predictability, and obedience, these are the things you should be doing. And then if you want to simply decrease annoying behaviors, which we have to do from time to time, you ignore, distract, or redirect. And if you want to deal with aggression and other more significant behaviors, you use a lot of consequences, timeouts, loss of privileges, natural and logical consequences. So <clears throat> as Wanda's saying, we, we're always trying to drag parents and teachers down to the bottom of the pyramid because truth is until this is set this doesn't work and parents and teachers will keep going back to this and wonder how come this kid you know is untreatable how come nothing ever works with this kid because this isn't set yet and once this is set yeah we can go back treating them like a fairly average kid and start setting some consequences and doing some charting and those sorts of things and that's why the parenting pyramid is so important. And we do this in normal social skills groups, i.e. pretty healthy parents, pretty healthy kids. 
but it's particularly important with our FASD RAD post-traumatic stress kits. So I'm going to skip to um, some of our examples. This is a case example that I want to talk about just really quickly. In our trauma and attachment program, we um, do sand tray work. It's not all that we do, but certainly we do sand tray therapy, um, play therapy. Um, not sure how clear it's coming across, but this is um, a case presentation from a few years back. And in this case presentation, this is true to life. This is, we took this and we got um, approval from the family um, for, to, to, to bring forth to people like yourself. So this is our very first sand tray. So this is probably the third week that we're starting with them. And in this sand tray, um, just to kind of give you background, this was a child that was about 10 years old and he lived in a foster family. The foster family was um, very involved, a um, little hesitant at first about the trauma and attachment program and the work that we were doing, but they, they were up for the challenge and, and they had been stable. The, the child had been with them for about 18 months prior to coming to, to um, receive treatment. And um, in the first session, the children, are, we, we just lay out the, the sand toys and they each have an individual sand tray and they work with their dyad. So their, their parent um, would be up here and they would be creating their sand tray. So as part of this um, sand tray, this is the very first sand tray, as you can see, um, the, there's a lot of stuff in the sand tray. And just from the feedback, um, what the child um, called the sand tray, he said that this was called the demolisher. And in, in the sand tray, you can see the, um, the man at the top there. He didn't really identify what the demolisher did other than he demolished a lot of stuff and put all this stuff in here. Um, initially, as you can see, it was pretty disorganized. Everything was just sort of placed in there. There didn't seem to be a reason or, or really a thoughtful process to that. Um, no themes came out other than sort of this, this demolisher theme um, and, and, um, and fear. So the next um, sand tray, which is, is literally the next week, um, the name of this sand tray was called the farm. And um, this became more realistic. Um, he talked about about this being a house or farm and interestingly enough he lived in a rural area with his foster family. Um, he talked about there being bad guys, still the demolisher guy, but he didn't call him the demolisher this time. Um, and his theme for this sand tray was really a need for protection, that the demolisher wasn't necessarily doing anything, but there was sort of this threat or this potential of, of danger. And um, he talked about there being some hypervigilance themes that came out and you had to be, be watchful or, or be, be aware and that people were in the house looking out and, and watching out for things. <clears throat> the next sand tray again he called the farm. And on the farm um, we could recognize within this that there was more organization. You can clearly see that the sand tray itself becomes more organized. Things are facing towards a certain area. And, and this became um, the bad guy. But as you can see, there's this whole sort of herd of protective animals. And the bad guy is now sort of cordoned off by these snakes and these boulders. And he's almost sort of falling outside of the tray. And, and in this, this sand tray, um, he, he said that um, there was fear kind of over to the side. Um, he used the same toys in his, in his um, sand tray, but there seemed to be more of an ability to defend himself and to um, do that. Interestingly enough, the house is still there, and there was some clear indication from when he was talking about his sand tray that um, people were around and that there was things going on in the house. There was somebody baking cookies. The next sand tray, you can see a clear division here. 
And um, interestingly enough, he talked about this side being more of the ocean and this side being what he called the forest. And the ocean, um, you know, without psychoanalyzing things too much, is really typically we would um, say that there's some themes about ocean and water that refer to very early experiences, um, experiences um, in utero potentially. Um, but he talked about, about the ocean and the ocean being um, sort of the bad versus good. And some clarity developed about some of the separation and that there was a clear separation from any threat. That this side was there were sharks and eels and problems going on under, under water. But on this side there, there was um, a, a new sort of house and again it was very positive and he reflected on this being very safe. So the development of a safe place. This one didn't come out as clear, but he talked about this and he gave this sand tray the name of Happy Place. And in his Happy Place, he discussed how it was safe and that this was a magical um, area that was defined and that it was all safe, it was protected. Um, he defined boundaries and, and in this, as you can see, there was no sort of threat. He um, he was an Aboriginal boy and he suddenly pulled this piece in there um, into his sand tray saying that this was a protector and no matter what would happen this was his protector and this theme actually came out um, on several occasions as he developed his safe place in, in his dyad work so his protector was always looking over into this safe place and was always there for him. Now there was a few other sort of themes similar to um, the previous sand trays, but in some of the last part of the sand tray work that we do, we pull the groups together to do what we call a community sand tray. And so to recognize again that it's a village and that while you can do um, some treatment and do some attachment work with your dyad, it's really important to bring that back to the community and how to facilitate that in a healthy, nurturing way. So the children kind of gather around this very large place and he was able to very much be a part of that. There wasn't any demonstrated anxiety, no sort of um, difficulty, whereas really early on he, you know, hardly could talk about his sand tray. He was very quiet and, um, you know, was not wanting to share so much and by the end he talked like he had been a public speaker for years it was it was incredible in this tray he was able to um, fully participate he was confident and eager to share about his place within the community and his place there were no um, I mean it was clearly delineated but it wasn't um, there, there wasn't any strict boundaries in terms of this has to be my place. It, it was nicely put within the community and again he called his spot the forest and in his forest he had um, his family and himself he talked about and that it was safe and everybody was sharing and there was a birthday cake that they were eating and, and celebrating and there was a globe, a little water globe here that he talked about and that that um, had magical powers again and kept him safe and so we were quite pleased with this and the outcome of this just for those of you who are wondering is um, shortly after the completion uh, of tag two the family who had been with him by this point just over almost two and a half years um, had adopted him and he requested to change his name to be a part of his adoptive family and um, to this day, this was 2007, um, to this day um, they're doing exceptionally well and we're very, very pleased. So I'm aware of time, I'm just going to skip through some of this. So recommendations and needs and implications for children and families with FASD and, and reactive attachment disorder is that there 
really needs to be more education. Teachers need to understand what they are dealing with with regard to behaviors um, and emotional pieces within the classroom. With, without that, um, you know, it's very, very difficult to address the, the children's needs and to not only educational needs, but social and emotional and spiritual needs. Um, careful multidisciplinary treatment planning for for the, the child, for the family. Um, we're very clear that there's no one way to treat these children and these families. They need lots of supports. There's no one place that has the answer. It's really about working collaboratively as a multidisciplinary team and then beyond that as a, as a community. Um, we again really encourage um, respite care and awareness for these families that while things can change and become very positive, there's a, clearly a potential that while children grow and develop with different developmental stages, that there will be somewhat of a regression or somewhat of a potential change. And so recognizing that sometimes those are kind of predictable, going from elementary school to junior high school or high school, that there's really predictable things that can be somewhat managed as part of a treatment, um, a treatment plan. Um, respite care is absolutely a necessity. And I think I'll stop there. Do you have anything to add? I think it's time for questions, comments, cases. So um, I'm not sure how this works. We would love to have some question comments from this room and of course from across the uh, province as well. And I don't know if they're going to show up on your laptop yeah, here. Yeah, I was just actually going to turn that off okay. so they can show up. Yep. Um, maybe we'll just take a couple of minutes so everyone can kind of gather their thoughts and uh, in this room and then at the far sites as well and then we'll come back in like two minutes and, and open it up for questions. We'll start with the live site here and then we'll go to the video conference sites. So hang tight and uh, we'll be back in two minutes. Typically, um, the families start in TAG 1, and, and that, uh, depending on the time of year, it ranges from about September until December. And then um, the start-up for TAG 2 would be January, um, going to about the end of May. Now, with that, so they sort of flow from one to the next, but there are some, some families that we, as a multidisciplinary team, would say, you know, you, you need to um, maybe work with your therapist one-on-one -on -one for a period of time and then come back or they repeat um, a portion of that or they go on to teen tag, which, which is for teens. Um, so so it's, it's about 12 weeks, 10 to 12 weeks. And is that once a week that they would come to actually It is. To participate? That's right. Once a week for a full morning. But when we think of the tag program, we think of it, at least I think of it in years. When they come in, they have to be stable enough to go into the program. They go into TAG 1, and we fluctuate. TAG 1 starts in September, in January, and then again in September. So there's always a TAG 1 running. There's always a TAG 2 that's following it. This is a teen TAG because we're getting more and more kids referred in their late elementary school years or early junior high school years. And then we run a TAG 3, which is a continuous support program uh, for the parents because we find that the parents get it and when they're in the program, they're fine, but they lose it. And it is the correct concepts of approaching these kids so that instead of taking things personally or getting driven crazy or et cetera, they come back and they, we basically drag them down to the bottom of the pyramid again and you know, remind them that we got to do this. You know? We got to really attune to these kids. And then some of the rest of it will come, but you got to then support them because you know, the kids are really out of sorts in their homes. And so, you know, all the way along, we'll look at their functioning levels and do they need a med here or there, or do we need to contact the schools because our clinical support workers are always contacting schools or other agencies to ensure that, you know, the village is sort of intact here. And um, so, 
by the time we actually graduate someone and say sort of goodbye to them, it's often years down the road. Because TAG3 is a continuous open-ended group that parents have been in sometimes for years. Uh, and a lot of these folks have two or three or four rad kids, FASD kids in the same home. So they're coming back for kidlet one, kidlet two, kidlet three kind of stuff. So. What age do you start the children at for the tag program? Uh, well, they start, um, <clears throat> you, you may know that at Castle we have a preschool program. So um, we'll start them fairly young. Uh, kindergarten, grade one uh, is where we typically start. Uh, tag one will start with anybody up to middle or upper levels of elementary school if they're small. And if they're larger grade five, grade six kids, they just may graduate up to the teen tag. You know, if they're if they be physically too imposing for a little tiny preschoolers that might be in tag one as well. So we try and get the right clinical mix in any program. Um, so that's that's the ages. It's really tricky when we get the teenagers, as you guys know. Just imagine them going through all their <clears throat> FASD, RAD, post traumatic stress issues, stress issues, and they want to live their teenage lives. And don't bug me. I'm living my life. You know, drop dead kind of stuff, you know? So we've got to deal with all of that reality and try and heal these kids. <clears throat> so we, in Teen Tag, we work with the parents first for about eight to 10 weeks. Tag, teen Tag is a bit different. It goes from September all the way through to um, March or April. And there's, because it's kind of Tag 1 and Tag 2 combined. So we just see the parents for the first 10 weeks or so, set the standards of, of, of what we expect them to be able to do. And a lot of it has to do with self-reflection. Um, we really take a lot of effort at helping our parents to learn to self-reflect. If a parent can't self-reflect, by and large, a child can't self-reflect. And a child's got to self-reflect to make use of this program. Um, there's some interesting studies, you know, uh, there's an instrument called the AAI, which is the Adult Attachment Inventory. How well attached we are as adults, our own template of attachment, if you will. And one of the studies suggested that about half of all foster parents, this is an American study, uh, are positive on the AAI, meaning they do not have a healthy parenting template. And they're, they're, they're fostering for all the right reasons. I want to love these kids because maybe I had a rough start in life, so I want to make sure these kids got a good chance. But boy, when you ask them to self-reflect, you're speaking Chinese to these guys. They just, you know, so then we have to do a lot of work with them. And we have people in our, uh, parents in our team tag right now, that we have to get off to their own therapists and doctors because they're having their own flashbacks, their, their own, you know, discordant states that they have to deal with, never mind their kid having flashbacks and, you know. So it's kind of a common problem. And you know the old adage that <clears throat> when you look for it, trauma and abuse will come out of the woodwork. Uh, and so it does. And so that's what we spend a lot of our time doing, is supporting the parents getting their own treatment, some of which happens in the program, but if they literally start to not function well, well, we've got to get them off to their own therapist and their own docs, just so they can function well. Prior to that, just to make a comment about the preschool children, although they're not a part of necessarily the trauma and attachment program, the treatment is essentially the same, is working with the dyad, um, doing in the infant preschool program they do a lot of work with modified interactive guidance, um, child parent relational therapy techniques, they do a lot of dyad work and so it's, it's similar although it would be more on a one-to-one -one basis. talked about um, uh, attachment um, being a dyadic experience with the mother and child, but increasingly uh, the research is telling us that the father has a really important role um, in, uh, the, um, in the life of the child. And I wonder if you could talk about the father's role, both in terms of attachment, but in terms of the ongoing uh, development of the skills of the child. Well, thank you. There was a fellow who came through town, and some of you may have seen him, I um, forget his name now, but he's a great speaker, and he's, he's done the research on uh, kids who have fathers versus kids who don't have fathers and what the father's at. Um, <clears throat> as I tried to intimate, um, 
we are speaking to the right hemisphere in a lot of what we do here. And so the left hemisphere work, which is a lot of education and typical household planning and, and those sort of things, um, people feel they're really good at that, so they ought to be able to talk to their kids, right? <clears throat> well, we have to learn the language of the right hemisphere. And moms and dads have natural abilities built in through nature and through you know, centuries and centuries of encoding this stuff of how to talk to both the right and left hemisphere. And whereas, as you know, women love to bond face to face and use a lot of words, and they do that with their kids, uh, men tend to want to bond shoulder to shoulder and get into some kind of activity or other. Marching off to war, marching off to a sport, marching off to golf or whatever, right? So um, <clears throat> both of those are helpful ways of, of speaking to both the right and left hemisphere and the language that each of those hemispheres understand. And um, so, um, you know, one of the old adages is that fathers are not supposed to mother, they're supposed to father. And it's tricky, even in normal human healthy relationships. You know, come on, change the diapers, and come on, do this, and come on, do that. Well, all that's fine, and all that should happen, I guess. But the father's got to be a father. They've got to toss the kid in the air. They've got to roughhouse with them on the rug. They have to take them out and kick the ball around. They have to do these things, and they speak to the development of the brain slightly differently than a, a typical maternal nurturance would speak to the either right or left hemisphere. So... Um, there's a lot more specifics than that, and I would just encourage you to, to Google fathering, and these things will come up. And I don't know, do you have any other thoughts about? No, I mean, that being said, specifically with regard to treatment, um, we've had fathers, not just mothers in the program, or, you know, adoptive or birth fathers, non-offending birth fathers attend our program. And it is this fine balance. It's, it's teaching those parents, um, whether it, it be a father or a mother, the same kinds of things. Um, the way that they might carry it out, I think, typically does look different, but it's the, the basis in terms of the attachment piece um, is similar. For example, we had a grandfather raising his grandchild in the program, and we always seeking some form of therapeutic touch, right? Well, this grandson was about um, I think he was 11 years old, but no kidding, he was about 5 foot 6 and about 150 pounds. He was a big kid. And the grandfather, what's typical sort of, um, well, he was in his early 70s, I think. And um, so there wasn't a lot of touch that went on, right? So we had to encourage, come on, we've got to figure some way, um, you've got to touch this kid because we need to get back to a little tiny bit of this. <clears throat> and anyway, we figured out that the kid would allow the grandfather to stroke his foot on the couch. And that's as far as we got with touch, but that's, that did it. This, this kid is pretty healthy now, and I mean, there's a lot else that went on, but just that little example of how we got, but the grandfather is great at teaching the kid mechanics, and a lot of doing, and a lot of um, other sensory work, um, but when it came to touch and cuddling and the, what we think of as maternal nurturance, that's as much as we got out of that particular situation. But they also have done very well, and this child is now in grade 10, and uh, it's basically discharged from our program now. We have a lot of grandparents, you guys must see this, we have a lot of grandparents raising the grandkids. So they're going through various levels of trauma, how their own kids went off the rails into drugs, alcohol, yada, 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 um, and now wanting to do it differently and better with their grandkids, and yet don't have innately a lot of different skills than they did when their own kids went off the rails. So there's some pretty tough slugging with some of those cases. Um, we have enough cases we, we could probably just do a, a grandparent-grandchild group and just be done with it and not integrate them into everything else. But we tend to have a great variation amongst the parents. Um, biological parents, as Wanda said, and um, the trick there is, is that when, if, the, if, if the mother or father has been a non-offending non uh, parent, but were around when the offense was going on, uh, it gets kind of tricky. And this gets into the whole, you know, gee, when do you allow visitation? And, you know, when can they see bio families and that sort of stuff? But that aside for a moment, um, uh, we, we mix them with adoptive parents, with long-term fostering parents, and then with the grandparents. So we got three or four different 
varieties, uh, and adoptive parents don't necessarily understand foster parents. You think they would, but they don't often speak the same language. Some of them would say, <clears throat> I adopted, or you know, I adopted this kid because God forbid they get into a foster home. And of course, there's you know three or four foster parents sitting in the room, right? So we have you know some tricky group dynamics to balance from time to time. Um, I know some of you are interested in this idea of in the treatment of trauma. When can when do we allow um, visitation? Uh, when is it a good idea to allow visitation of the biological families? And often we're in and out of court trying to uh, answer these kind of questions. Well, here's what I like to tell judges. Um, I say, you know, if a kid was playing hockey and everyone loved this kid playing hockey, his parents and family loved him playing hockey, he lived in a small town, the small town loved to come out and watch this kid play hockey, he was a great hockey player, uh, the, the professionals wanted to come and watch this kid play hockey, the whole deal. But he gets himself a serious concussion. And so, in hockey, if you get a serious concussion, you don't go back to play until the doc says you're ready, right? Because there's some brain injury there, right? Well, our kids have brain injury through trauma, through attachment, and through fetal alcohol. They have three levels of brain injury. And the healing of the brain injury when it comes to trauma is what Wanda spoke about, the coherent, realistic narrative, which means I can tell you my story. Gee, I was born here. I live with this set of parents. They were my biological family. Then this and this and this happened. I couldn't live with them any longer. And then I was taken into care, and I lived with this and this foster home. And finally, here I am, and I'm in a forever safe home. Without necessarily idealizing someone, and they can do no wrong, or demonizing someone, and they can do no good. Right? A coherent, realistic narrative, and here's where things fit into my story. And when they have that, we might say, you know what? I think they can safely have some visitation with the offending biological parents. But that might be years later, because at that point, I'd tell a judge, OK, you know what? I think they're ready to get back in the game. I think their concussion is healed, enough to get back into the game. And are they, just like the hockey player, more prone to the next concussion? You bet they are. So these have to be supervised, and yada, 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 and, you know, and we're always dealing with this. And, and then when it's an offending um, bio parent and, and the, and the non-offending bio parents in our program, well, we're always dealing with court cases, but I get to see my kid, and you can't take away my rights, and this and that, and the judges agree half the time. And so, you know, every time the kid goes to visit the parents, well, we, you know, three steps forward, two steps back kind of stuff. So we're fighting those battles sometimes, and we just think that's part of the deal. It's just the battles we have to fight in order to get these kids protected in the safe place, let them develop their coherent, realistic narrative, and then maybe they get to get back in the game. Do we have any access to the sites? Yeah, we just can't see them, but we'll be able to hear them. So let's okay. open it up to Lethbridge. Do you guys have any questions before we wrap up? Windy we can't us. see you, so we don't know if you're trying to talk with your microphones <laughs> muted. So just remember to unmute your mics. We might ask them to say no questions. Okay, well, I think we're good then. It's, uh, we should probably wrap, actually. We have uh, another question down okay. before we wrap. Okay. I just had a question about um, if parents are fetal alcohol as well, how does oh therapy work? <laughs> not we not easily. It, well, exactly. We see it a lot, you know, with children's services where we have parents who are fetal alcohol and they're caring for their child who also has fetal Yeah. We don't see a lot of them in the TAG program because yeah. they probably wouldn't get in the TAG program. Yeah. But do we see those cases in CASA? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and do we see them so in the they community? Would, they don't fit. They don't fit here. Um, there has to be a certain level. Well, I don't know. Do you think they fit here? Well, I, I wanted to clarify. I, I don't think that they would necessarily come to the TAG program, but essentially I can specifically remember just personally dealing with a couple of cases like that. and really um, depending on the level of um, functioning um, for the parent or caregiver the same things apply and in in more often cases is that the the caregiver is also kind of getting their own therapy at the same time and so 
they're doing the same sorts of things. Um, what we're very aware of is that they need lots of supports to sort of contain that. Is it possible? I, I think it's possible. I think it's absolutely possible with more supports and, and more sort of, you know, adjunctive therapies in place. So we don't not treat them, probably not in this program as much as just case by case and have an individual therapist. And often they're case managers just to keep track of different services these folks need, and partnering with you guys and teachers and et cetera. Good question, though. Yep. Just uh, one more question, if you don't mind, about the um, external brain. And it sounds to me like the external brain would be particularly important in a family where both the parent and the child are affected. So what would that look like, and how long would that need to be? You know, there's, a, there's a lot of research now about the brain plasticity. And what effect does that mentoring or that external brain have on the brain plasticity? Well, uh, you're right. There's, a, there's books and books now on, on, on neuroplasticity. Um, and, and it's hopeful. And, and what I'd like to maybe say at this point is you know how we're all trained to realize that there's certain critical periods when kids are young. And there's this thought that, well, you've got to use it or you lose it. Right? So then there's this pessimism. Well, if we don't see kids till they're five or six, well, what do you do, you know, because they, they're already long past their critical periods. Well, there's a new science of a, a constant adaptation. And it's as scientifically valid as the critical period piece. And the critical period piece is true, and there's good science for it, and it's the whole foundation of success by six and zero to three in the states and a lot of organizations that have a lot of political clout behind them. Um, the constant adaptation pathways are the ones we have to use when we inherit kids at five or six years old all the way through to their teens. And that does mean, as, um, as is pointed out here, that we have to depend on those parts of the brain that overgrew and shouldn't have overgrown, and those parts of the brain that didn't grow enough and haven't grown yet, that that can actually rebalance itself. These pair themselves back, and these grow into what they should have become, or at least some semblance of that, so these kids have a chance of succeeding in the real world, and um, they do. And it's never quite as good as had it never happened in the first place, but they have a pretty good chance of succeeding in life, and the level of supports for the external brain, um, I mean, if, in your case, if you've got an FASD parent and an FAS child, then you probably need almost a daily input of external brain for both of them at some point. If you've got a healthy parent, um, then that's really taxing on the healthy parent to be a 24-7 external brain. Uh, there's several levels of that. There's ADD, kids who need a 24-7 external brain, and then there's the FASD kids who need it even more. Um, and our RAD kids, we often joke that they're 24-7. You do not take your eyes off these kids because of their boundary issues. And the parents know that, and they'll tell the schools, watch out, don't take your eyes off this kid, because that's when he'll get, he or she will get in trouble. Um, there's some really great books on neuroplasticity. Uh, Siegel writes some of them. And uh, if you just, if you just uh, Google neuroplasticity, you'll si find some amazing stuff on what we are now capable of understanding the brain can do if it's given a chance to heal. And that's the, the short Rossi is another one with regard to neuroplasticity. Rossi, R-O-S-S-I. OK, I'd like to uh, thank Wanda and Drew for the presentation this morning. Unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. But thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. And uh, I certainly found it a, a really good blend. And thank you for doing that of information, uh, some real good practical um, information around uh, kids and families and the case studies I found particularly hopeful so uh, thanks very much a few reminders um, about the evaluation forms and once again they are important to us so when that email pops up um, please take the time to fill that out and send it back to us and the next uh, session is scheduled for um, November 24th that's today or it's yeah, this afternoon. This afternoon, said today. Hmm, confuse me. 
uh, 2.30 to 3.45 with Christine Anderson on animal-assisted therapy and clients with FASD. So it's interesting that came up this morning as one of those things. Thanks. So again, thank you very much here and for the folks out there. And thank you to the presenters.